we are continuing the series of there is more and today I'm going to um, share with you a message about going from professing to possessing many of us we profess God's blessings that God has for us we know that in Christ we are seated in the heavenly places can somebody say amen in Christ we already have everything pertaining to life and godliness can I get a witness in Christ we are already victorious in Christ there is no condemnation in Christ we are healed in Christ we are blessed in Christ we are delivered in Christ we have victorious life is anybody happy and thankful that you are in Christ see people in the world live in crisis we live in Christ can somebody say amen touch your neighbor say you're in Christ touch your neighbor and touch your other neighbor and say don't live in crisis we live in Christ amen but the problem that many many of us have is the fact that we like to profess these things but then when we look at the reality of our life many times we don't possess them meaning we don't see the reality of them and the Lord wants to shift that and he wants to change that amen somebody say there is more there is more we believe that there is more that's why we show the testimonies we don't approve every testimony that we see sometimes people come up and it's like so you know I, I, I googled this guy I, I saw he has this and that the testimonies we show is not us saying we approve and we know everything about these ministries when I read Joshua it doesn't mean I approve of every action Joshua did in the Bible when I read Solomon I don't approve of Solomon's idol worship uh-huh one time I had a person who said, I can't believe I'm going to stop listening to your sermons because you mentioned Benny Hinn. I said, well, you better also stop listening to my messages because I mentioned David. He committed adultery and killed the guy. And I keep reading his Psalms almost every day. I was like, and if that doesn't offend you, I don't know what could. Don't, I, we, we're not, we're showing God's glory. He uses people in the Bible who were not perfect and people on this earth who are not perfect. And we're also showing what's possible. The potential that God has for us. What we see today is not what God has for us. God has more. Even Jesus who we see as the ceiling of the supernatural. He looked at the crowd and looked at his disciples and says, you will do greater works. If Jesus being the ceiling always saw something more, how much more? We're the floor. We have to constantly be aware there is more. That's why we sing, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty for the living God. I don't want to be a preacher who only explains the gospel. I want to experience it. I don't want to be a person who only gives information. We want to see the demonstration of His power. We want to see His power being manifested. That's why we want to present the stories. We, we come to church, those of you who are visiting us for the first time, we're a little bit crazy. Yes, I know that you're getting that little smoke right now in your, in your nose and stuff, but the church in hungry generation is not satisfied with just preaching cut sermons and eloquence of speech without providing an opportunity where your mascara gets ruined on your face where you get on your knees and say God I need you where you say God touch my body touch my marriage touch my finances because I'm here to taste God not just to hear about God not just to sing about God not just to read about God but to taste God. Can somebody say amen? Can somebody say hallelujah? Anybody here tasted God and found Him to be good? Found Him to be faithful? Found Him to be never leave you and never forsake you? If you are, wave your hand at me. Come on somebody. Joe, if you can give me a little bit more juice. Thank you. That is more. <laughs> Come on Jesus. <laughs> somebody is getting it. Let's open Joshua chapter 1 verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you as I said to Moses. Last few weeks we talked about this whole series is based on Israel entering the promised land. We started to talk about the paddling in prayer. How when you pray the promises of God you see what's available to you even when you stop being desperate you should never lose your desire if you focus on what God has promised to you 
also we talked about the supernatural supply how when you enter the promised land Moses the rod and manna doesn't enter there but God's promise still is intact meaning certain people will help you to get here but they will not help you to get there and when you lose them don't lose your hope of the future because your future is never attached to people who left you it's attached to God who is still with you that's a good preaching and, and a shouting point right there thank you Jesus hallelujah this week I'm going to talk to you about moving from professing to possessing I want us to take notes statistics says if you take notes higher chance of making to heaven I just made that up I'm sorry the first point I want you to write this down is that we have to move from waiting upon God to working with God wilderness was a time when Israel was waiting for the cloud to move I love those prayers they sound so spiritual Lord if you don't go with us we will not go but these are not prayers we are to pray because God is already with us and he's saying if you don't go I don't go when the cloud moved so did God but when they entered the Jordan River the Bible says God changes the rules of the game he changes the rules of supernatural where he says now when your feet step into the Jordan River I go with you God didn't say I will split the Jordan River and then you go God says you go and I split the Jordan River with the Red Sea they were waiting for the river to be split and then they went with the Jordan they went and the river split you are not facing a Red Sea you are facing a Jordan in the sense that God is not going to do it and then you go you are going to go and God is going to do it don't just wait on God work with him many Christians they know what it's like to say I have nobody without God Jesus says you're nobody you're nothing without me and we know that we say oh Lord I am nothing without you if you don't do it I'm not going to be able to do it and that is true but that is only 50% of the truth the other percent 50% is when Paul says I can do everything through Christ I am nothing without Christ that's only 50% the other 50% is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me you got to combine both of these truths can somebody say amen We see that Jesus tells his disciples go into all the world preach the gospel baptize people teach them and then he says in Matthew chapter 28 he says lo I am with you always the lo is after the go first is the go and then is the lo Jesus adds the lo to go that means that he says I'm gonna go with you when you go he didn't say you know what I want you to wait he only said that once to disciples and they waited for 10 days and no longer is the church required to wait now we pray in our prayer time we wait upon God in prayer time that is true and that is extremely important we come to dependence on God but what I do not want us to have is this I don't want you to shift the responsibility for revival on your life on God we don't shift the responsibility for miracles on God we share responsibility with God for miracles in our life if revival depends on God every church would have it if revival depends on God every nation will have it God doesn't play lottery with revival he doesn't just blindly says ah uh, I like the city uh yeah I like that church I like that church God doesn't pick and choose we choose revival the Bible says it is the will of God for everyone to be saved why are people not getting saved because it's not your will when it becomes your will when it becomes your passion when it becomes your desire when we partner with God God begins to move somebody shout amen God's power is already connected to us you and I are like a faucet in the house the city connects the water to your house 
and then there is these pipes that go to every single bathroom every sink the water is already there the city did their job they connected the water they opened the water to your house but there will be not one drop in the sink of your house until you open the faucet the Holy Spirit has already been connected to you as a Christian the temple of God the Holy Ghost is connected God opened the wall in heaven he already sent the angels he already sent the spirit he already released the promise he already released and now everything is connected to you and so my assignment today is not for wait for God to send a city official to open the faucet my assignment today is to use my own hands and to open the faucet in my own house that the city has its water connected to. I open my mouth and God says to one prophet, prophesy. God tells you speak to the mountain. God says pray. God says fast. God says trample upon the serpents. God says open up your faucet. Somebody give God a shout of praise right now. Come on. Somebody give God a shout of praise right now. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in, in Mark chapter 16, it says the following. And as they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them. Turn to your neighbor and say, God wants to work with you. God is not working for you because some of you think you have God on a payroll uh, I need this 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 no 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 God is not running errands he doesn't work for you he works with you we're partners you're not the boss if some of you say he is the Lord but he wants to work with us he says you step in I step in you step into the Jordan my glory steps into the Jordan when Samson caught foxes he put their tails together and put a fire in their tail not on their nose in their tail it means where, what whatever they went the fire went behind them we have to embrace a New Testament mindset and the New Testament mindset is this we don't wait on God to preach the gospel, heal the sick and cast out devils. We work with God. The idea that oh if the Holy Spirit doesn't go with us, really what else is he gonna do? He will go with us. Now in our private time, in our fasting time, we, we wait upon God. We come and say Lord I am nothing without you. And the moment you come out of your prayer time, you say Lord I can do all things through you. Never in public acknowledge that you're nothing because that's not true and in private don't come and make up something that you're something in private remain a beggar in public be a lion in private be a lamb saying Lord I love you so much I am absolutely nothing and I don't want to be anything without you but the moment you come out of that you, you better be a lion you better be a warrior in private I'm a worshiper in public I'm a warrior in private I commune with God in public I command the mountain because God's power is attached now to you God says let's share responsibility don't shift the blame on me don't say revival is God's job revival is our job it's God's and my job we are yoked together that means we're carrying it together God is not pulling everything I'm pulling it with him and he got the heavy part of course I'm doing the light part can somebody say amen revival is our job with God it's not God's job if everyone in the city would live like you do would we have revival in the city if everyone in the city would pray like you pray, would this city be changed? If everybody in the city would read the Bible like you do, if everybody in the city would sneak out at Friday night and Saturday night as you do, would we have revival? You have to ask yourself this question. I ask myself regularly this question. If every member in our church will live like I do, would our church experience revival? Because nobody, I shouldn't expect revival out of you until I expect revival out of me. Revival can only happen through us because it first has taken a place in us.
Our desire is not to bring revival to the city. Our de desire is first to bring revival into our own life and let it spill into our sphere of influence and affect our cities. Take care of revival in your family. Actually, man, take care of revival in your personal life. It will spill into your family. It will spill into your marriage. It will spill into your kids. Maybe not right away, but sooner or later. Amen. I want you to write down point number two. Before the sword can conquer your enemy, it will cut your flesh. When Israel crossed the Jordan River, the first order of God was not for them to go attack the enemy. God's first assignment for Israel was to be circumcised. Now during the first service, a young man on the drum started to drum it when I said uh, circumcised. Um, and I wasn't sure if he was giving praise report for the fact that we no longer need to do that or, or something. But, but it, it was very important. We no longer need to do physical circumcision. And I say, Lord, thank you for that. Amen. But the circumcision that God wants to do in our life is using a knife, flint knives of the Word of God. God wants to cut away the reproach of Egypt. God wants to cut away our old stinking thinking. God wants to cut away bad attitudes. God wants to cut away habits that do not glorify His name. God wants to cut certain things off of us before He uses that sword to conquer our enemy. The Word of God, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, it says it's a double-edged sword. One of the reasons why one side of that sword doesn't cut the enemy is because the other side hasn't cut me. Why should the devil respond better to God's word than you do? Why should demons tremble if you don't shake? Why should the devil flee if you don't even humble yourself in front of God's word? I'm going to give you a secret. One of the reasons why our words against the enemy has no power is because God's word in our heart has no power. The Bible says submit yourself to God and then resist the devil. Rebuking is only as powerful as the depth of my repentance. If I don't allow the word of God to come inside and pull some things, shift some things, build some things, make me weep, make me shout, make me praise, make me change my mood, literally mess me up. If that word has no power in me, why should it have power through me? See before the word of God can conquer the enemy, there is one part of that word that will cut you. I'm not saying make you feel bad. Actually, it will cut something bad. It will bring comfort. It will bring conviction. It will bring power. It will change you on the inside because God's word is a double-edged sword. One blade is for the devil. One blade is for me. Come on, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And sometimes, sometimes the word of God is so dull to us, it's barely going to be sharp against the devil. Let God's word be fresh in you. You won't be surprised. You'll be surprised how fiery you'll become against the enemy. If you want it to work against the devil, let it work first in you. Meaning become a student of God's word. Pick up your Bible again. Download the version app again. I know you deleted it because there was not enough space on the phone. Get the streaks again. Start a Bible reading plan again. You will say, but I failed so many times. Start again. Begin to memorize the Word again. Don't just read the Bible. Let the Bible read you. Have a time where the sharpness of God's Word makes you go, ah, this is good. It's a bread. It's a seed. It's the hammer. It's the oil. The Word of God is a fire shut up in my bones, the prophet said. Let it be something that feeds me, only then it will fight the enemy. If it doesn't feed you, it won't fight your enemy. And so what, what he teaches us, Joshua teaches us is this, is that before you use the blade against the Philistines, Midianites, parasites and every other ites, let the blade go This is so good. 
man, wow, this, I, I could, I'm going to tweet this because this, this is good. This is ministry. When it's good to you, it's going to be the devil's going to say here, say, this is so bad. This is so bad. This hurts. Do you know why Jesus could say it is written and the devil was wounded? Because that it is written first was ministering to Jesus before he ministered to the devil. Before he administered that word. God's word has two sides. One blade is for your flesh. One blade is for you and the other blade is for the enemy. Before you pull it out against your enemy, pull it first for yourself and prune your own life with that word. Prune your thinking, prune the negativity, prune the defeated, prune the trauma and the drama, prune the hurt and the pain, the habits, the hang-ups, prune all of that out. Let it work in you before it works through you. This applies also in marriage. The principle of cutting before conquering. You can't conquer happiness in marriage until you cut back on certain things certain habits, certain attitudes. You can't conquer financial prosperity until you cut back certain subscriptions and leaks in your finances which take up a lot of money. When I was 16 years of age, you know, I, I realized that I don't need to compete to win public's approval because I was already behind. My physical appearance didn't help me so I knew that I was way behind on winning people's approval. So I'm like, since I'm so behind, I'm just not going to even run that race. <laughs> so I did not need to buy the latest, coolest. The reason why is because I knew it will never help me to win the public approval. So what I did is I didn't care what people thought about me. I started to save money more toward eventually building an investment instead of buying money to impress people that I don't like with money I don't have to buy things I don't need at the age of 20 I conquered my first real estate property but the only reason is because at the age of 16 I cut back certain things you can't conquer if you don't cut some of you you're saying why why am I cannot conquer this deal this dream see in order to conquer you gotta cut even right now you know one of the reasons I released the book three years ago I felt the Lord lead me in my heart to reduce my life to one thing not to do everything but to do one thing and and I felt in my heart that one thing that I'm called to do is to lead and to feed and that is to communicate and so I do one thing I did a little bit of real estate now I trimmed that what I want to do only communication so for me book is communication social media is communication YouTube is communication audio podcast is communication when I travel it's communication yes I do many things but in reality I do only one thing and the reason I'm able to conquer the area of my calling is because everything else is being cut to help me fulfill only that calling if you want to conquer you gotta cut can somebody say amen See some of you, you have so many things growing right now and you're saying why none, none of it really takes off. It's because you're growing everything. Yeah. Grow one thing That's right. and it will grow. On, Amen. 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 I want you to write down point number three. When there is no solution to the problem, seek to live in awareness of the promise or the presence. When there is no solution to the problem, seek to live in awareness of God's presence. So we see this Israel coming to the Jordan and God is teaching them the importance of stepping in first instead of just waiting for God to step in first. So you take the risk. You move by faith. It's actually incredible because if you read the Bible you will see that God called Israel a people until they got to promised land. The moment they enter the promised land God calls them a nation. I believe when you start living by faith God begins to change your name and God calls you believer. Maybe you grew up being negative, maybe in negativity, pessimism, being doubtful, being full of anxiety is what runs in your family. But when you begin to take that first step with God, God begins to change your name and He says, listen, you're a believer now. I've given you a word of faith. I've given you a spirit of faith. I've given you a measure of faith. I've given you a household of faith. I've given you a gift of faith so you can live a life of faith because I am pleased by faith. God changes your name. 
and then when we come out of that Jordan the Lord begins to bring cutting in our life he begins to allow his word to create a powerful change within us positive change good change and this empowers us to conquer the enemy Israel faced their first challenge in the promised land I like what Pastor Ilya mentioned today how success is a lot of responsibility success it's not paychecks coming to your mail and you're just buying toys and you're posting on Instagram how nice cars you have and all. that's not what success is. Success is that you're faithful what you have and your employer comes in and gives you more work. Your pastor comes in and says you're running this ministry so great can I put three more ministries on you? Success is more responsibility and responsibility is not fun. Israel comes to the promised land and they face the first problem. This problem was something they've never faced before. Up to this point, everybody they did not like and everybody that hated them came after them. So it was easy. You see the enemy, you go fight. They come into promised land and their enemy hides behind walls. And not only hides behind walls, their enemy has walls so big, Israel has no weapons to defeat them. Their enemy shuts the door and keeps the lock inside. Israel is in the promised land but they have a problem. Have you ever been in a place in your life where there was a time you dreamed to be in that place and once you arrived there you met your Jericho. When you were single you were wishing to get married until you got married and you met your Jericho. Yeah her name yeah that's Jericho and she doesn't want to talk to you. She's closed and you've tried every five languages, every key you stuck into that, into that lock, ain't talking back. And this is already the third day you're sleeping on the couch. The woman, the Jericho doesn't want to talk back. You're like, I thought this will feel better. This looked good. But it's a problem. You wish to have children. Children is such a great blessing from God. They're the quiver. They're the arrows in your quiver. Then they become teenagers. <laughs> then you face your Jericho. When that spoiled bread that you fed and brought into this world, things they got the world figured out. And they're telling you how to run the world and how to run the family. And they don't want to talk to you. And you try to threaten them. I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. And you see them calling the police from the phone number you are paying for. <laughs> when you finally get that business and you got that one or two people working for you and things are finally going great and things are going great until you start realizing you gotta pay taxes. Until you start realizing you gotta look for a job. See you hated being an employee because somebody always controlled me and I always had to be here till five until and the beauty of being a your own boss is so great until you have to look for a job. You have to look for contracts. If that doesn't go through it's on your food on the table that goes out. We don't realize but the promised land has its challenges and sometimes these challenges are so much bigger than the challenges of Egypt and it makes the promised land feel like pit of hell. We loved having interns when we didn't have them. <laughs> interns, you're great but I'm just gonna tell you the truth. Until we got interns. First year that we had interns. I remember I came to prayer and I said, God, I will never ever do internship again in my life. I was like, why did you Lord take the most difficult people all around the world and ship them all at once to hungry generation? Why? Because the first week I faced with challenges. They came with problems. They came with difficulties. Some of them didn't even know they had these difficulties. But then by the end of internship, I was like, you know what? Uh, we can try one more time. And next year we tried it again. Then this internship started and the first week I was like Lord Jesus what did we got ourselves into? 32 teenagers they are so... Amen. One person texted me 
this is happening that the person this drama is happening this is happening and sometimes I feel like eaten by hyenas like by news report ah, ah. I'm like and then I was like man this is so hard but this is what I remind myself I said Lord if it wouldn't be for the entrance I wouldn't have these challenges I remember when we didn't have challenges because we had nobody at church I said Lord I thank you for every problem every difficulty every Jericho every challenge I have because of the promised land I stepped into never let you oh Jesus thank you Father thank you Jesus never lose sight of the beauty of promised land because you met your Jericho that's the that's the beautiful part about promised land is you get Jerichos you get challenges you get you get hardships but God is always with you and you will always overcome if you want to get rid of the Jericho you will lose the promised land so overcome the problem with Jericho but I want to speak about something right now that I believe will be a catalyst in overcoming our Jericho Jericho shuts its doors and Israel is facing a battle they're not equipped to win right now and instead of running from that battle or instead of Israel allowing this to overwhelm them I want you to see what God tells Israel to do he says I want you to take an ark of the covenant put it on your shoulders and walk around the city of Jericho seven times the first day I want you to walk around the city I want you to see what they were supposed to carry on their shoulders not the weight of the wall but the weight of the presence they don't know how they're gonna conquer it they don't have some secret weapon they're developing they don't have a tank they don't have a nuclear weapon they don't have any kind of explosives that they're hiding somewhere in the wall nobody is planning a secret secretly to remove to open the door from the inside Israel does not know how to conquer it have you ever faced something you don't know how to conquer let me tell you what not to do don't let the problem climb on your shoulders don't let the doctor's report climb on your shoulders don't let the fact that your kid is not talking to you climb on your shoulders don't let the fact that you promise you will never do that sin and you've done again don't let that climb on your shoulders I know you're struggling with that but don't let your struggle land on your shoulder keep walking around that struggle having something different on your shoulder you will say well it's impossible not to let that be on my shoulder think about this two minutes after you're dead it's not gonna be a problem no problem whatsoever if whatever financial problems you have two minutes after you're dead no more a problem I always tell that to myself whenever I say that it's so hard to get the problems off of me I say it's crazy how my heart stops beating and the problem leaves if my heart stops beating and, and removes the problem why can I stop that problem with the power of the Holy Spirit right now I keep this rule five by five if in five years this problem is not going to be a problem I will not take more than five minutes to care about it move on from it five minutes okay 450 430 five minutes is gone that's it you have to move on why because these problems I know they're big I know they scream the loudest you can never lend them on your shoulders because when they are on your shoulders they can't change you change they crush you they affect your knees they affect your back and instead of seeing walls fall you fall the presence of God when it goes on your shoulders I stand and on the walls God begins to put his finger on his walls because he sits on me so he's closer to the wall so he goes in to the wall like this and I, the reason why God wanted them to be close so he could keep the finger on the wall did you know the walls fell supernaturally they fell supernaturally they didn't just fall supernaturally God put his finger on it why did he put his finger because they kept him close to the wall and he was on the shoulders when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death walk with ark on your shoulders when you walk through divorce walk with the ark on your shoulders when you walk through a heartbreak or maybe abuse or maybe something very difficult and you're being healed as you walk through that still don't let the devil fool you and say you have to carry you're called to conquer it and the only way you conquer it is if you don't carry it carry the presence somebody say I carry the presence say I will conquer the problem by carrying the presence 
that's why Jesus says you will receive what power when the spirit will come what power is never released if he doesn't come upon but if we want to see power released he has to come upon but for some of us before he comes upon you gotta do some He's saying, you know what, that is the problem. Yes, yes, it's true. It's a terminal illness. Yes, it's true. It's a challenge I have in my marriage. Yes, it's true. It's a problem I have. But you know what, right now, if it's not going to be a problem two minutes after death, it's not going to be a problem right now. Because the living God lives in me. And in the midst of Jericho, I'm going to walk in the presence of God. I will walk in the peace of God. I will walk in the power of God. And as you do that, your walls begin to melt. Your problems begin to change. And you are preserved. Can somebody say amen? Somebody say praise God hallelujah and I want us to write this down the last point and we'll come to prayer build memorials to God's miracles not monuments to your mistakes when Israel passed through the Jordan River after they finished God circumcised them uh, actually Joshua circumcised them but after, uh, according to God's instruction the Lord tells Joshua send 12 men back to that place and I want you to go into the bottom of Jordan River and I'm gonna come down I'm, I want you to go to the bottom of the Jordan River and once you reach the lowest point of the Jordan River I want the 12 men to find some stones from there take the stones out from there and bring them to the promised land and set up like a monument and God says this is to remind future generations that I was with you I did the miracle God wants us actually Joshua set up six more six or seven memorials during his lifetime sometimes he killed one king and put a huge pile for as a reminder the king is dead Joshua wanted the nation to have memorials of God's victories and God's miracles not monuments of what God has not done what has not happened the prayer God has not answered that person God has not healed that that time when God didn't come through that time where, where was God in that God does not want you to build monuments to unanswered prayers but memorials to his miracles in your life some of us struggle with our faith not because our faith is weak our memory is short we remember things we should forget and forget things we should remember don't remember your mistakes remember God's miracles we tend to our mind gravitates to always remember what we've done wrong disciples were the same way Jesus heals the Jesus feeds the nations he feeds so many people and then finally he gets in a boat and he says uh, stay away from the laven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the disciples like dude you forgot bread no you did man we forgot bread I, I can't believe this and Jesus is reminding right in front of us about the bread we forgot bread man oh, man. man we could take somebody to bring us bread but we were already in the middle of the lake we forgot bread and Jesus says what are you guys talking about we forgot bread he says why do you always remember your problems he says do you remember how many people I fed and I want you to see Jesus gravitates their mind to what, what he did instead of what they have not done don't let your mind like a magnet be drawn to your mistakes draw to God's miracles you say but I ain't got much miracles on the cross Jesus died for you that's a miracle he loves you that's why the last supper Jesus says do this in remembrance of me if you have nothing else to remember remember how much he loves you remember that he loves you so much that he died on the cross for you and rose from the dead for your justification remember me Jesus said hallelujah promised land is when you set up memorial stones in your mind and these stones are of God's activity in your life do you know why you have to do that because there will be moments God is not going to speak you will have to rely on what he did before to give you faith for what you're facing right now there will be moments when you will face the Goliath and Sam and Samuel prophet Samuel is not gonna pick up the phone and there's gonna be no word from God popping from the Bible to encourage you and you're gonna have to go back to your memorial stone of killing the lion and the bear to say if God was with me there he was with me here and he is with me now and this Goliath will fall can somebody say amen even 
an angel of God when he came to Mary and said Mary you're gonna have a child and Mary says that is not possible angel you understand I'm, I'm not married and it's gonna be controversial there's gonna be a lot of drama there and the angel instead of saying well you know what I was in heaven we kind of saw how God you know kind of created the gold out of nothing and stuff angel wasn't telling her what happened in heaven he says your relative Elizabeth angels watch testimonies angels reference testimonies angel didn't touch her so she feel the power he filled her mind with a stone your relative he never said something about Mary's life sometimes there are no memorial mir miracles in your life borrow it from your neighbor borrow it from YouTube borrow it from someone else that is why we play these things at church that's why I regularly play these in my own life why I want my mind to reflect the possibilities in God not the problems of life not the challenges of life not my issues but my identity can somebody say amen some of you you have a monument that's built it's what you've done I understand it ended up in the newspaper I understand your driving record confirms it I understand you have a little blower thing that you blow before you can start your car yeah I understand you lost your virginity maybe you understand you've been abused and you you feel like you're second best I am here today to ruin your monument I am here today to devastate that monument and say stop building that God says pull the stones from the lowest point of your life not to remind you you've been hurt but to remind you that didn't kill you to remind you God was there with you and that did not end your life and if it didn't end you there it will not end you here God is still with you he did not leave you he did not abandon you come on somebody give God a shout of praise hallelujah hallelujah The only thing Jesus left was a tomb and you're not a tomb, you're a temple. He is always with you. That's why you got to pick up the stones from the lowest point of your life. Not to remind that you cannot trust people. Not to remind yourself that listen, you're done with marriage because you got burned. No, God says pick up that stone to remind you even when you fail, He was still there. He was still there. He is still here right now. He's the God of second chances. He's the God of third chances. He's the God of fourth chances. He's going to be the God of fifth chances. He is your God. He is your God. He is my God. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in this room right now. That if some of you, you went to the lowest point of your life to remind you of how somebody dropped you, how somebody betrayed you and you relive these things. I'm here to ruin those monuments. Push them, push those rocks that they slip. You were convinced you'll never succeed. You were convinced you will never prosper. You will never be healthy because everybody in your family dies by 50 from cancer. I'm here to push those stones and to say this. Set up a memorial in your mind. Set up a reminder that God's been with you. If He has not been with you, He's been with your family. He's been with this church and He will never leave you, never forsake you. Karamanaldes, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. If you are surrounded with problems right now, it's weighing you down and you came today crushed. Quickly run out of your seat, come to the front. I'm, we're going to pray right now. If you feel like, you know what? I've been through stuff and I'm feeling it right now. I just need some prayer right now. Just come out of your seat. It's not an altar for salvation. This is, God's going to do something right now. God's going to begin to ruin the monuments and build the memorials. You don't have to be a member of our church to receive prayer. But just run to the front and say, Lord, I just need more of you. Place an ark on my shoulders. Place an ark on my shoulders. Place your presence on my shoulders. Place your anointing on my shoulders. I'm tired of getting these demons. I'm tired of getting these problems. I'm tired of getting these issues right now. I want more of you, God. Just run, just run, just run to the front and God's going to meet you. Church, come on, lift those hands right now. Begin to worship. Don't put the smoke. Just worship, just worship Him right now. If our prayer team can come out right now, if the intercession team can come out as well, let us, let us pray. Let us bless these people right now. I'm hungry and I'm thirsty. Let 
the glory of God descend on you right now. Let the glory of God descend on you right now. As you're lifting your hands, you say, Come, Jesus, fill me right now. Push down my wall. Push down my poverty. Push down my problem. person next to you right now place your hand on their shoulder and I want you to pray for the ark to descend right now miracles are gonna be taking place right now play for their shoulder begin to pray right now that on their shoulder there is gonna be a grace of God if somebody's standing in front of you you can place it on their shoulder in front of you let's begin to pray right now that the praise the presence of God will descend on their shoulders and will live and will live in the awareness of the glory of God in Jesus name Yes, Father, we pray, Lord, that the heaviness and the problems on our shoulders, Father, will be exchanged for your presence, Lord, for your freedom, for your peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, that we're not going to be carriers of our mistakes. We're not going to be carriers of our problems, of our worries, of our anxiety, of our fears, but we'll be carriers of your presence. We ask, Lord, that our shoulders, our lives, Father, will carry the presence of the Holy Spirit the promises of God, every word that you've spoken to our lives will be upon our shoulders, Lord, because your yoke is easy. Father, your burden is light. Father, we put that on ourselves right now. We cast aside every fear, every heaviness, every trouble, every doubt in Jesus' mighty name. a child will raise it to the Father. Say, come Jesus with power. Come with wonders. Come on, invite him right now in your situation. Say, Lord, I expect miracles. Lord, I carry your presence in my situation. The finger of God is power. The hand of God is power. Stretch your hand. Do what only you can do in my marriage. Do what only you can do in my relationship. God, you see, I can't do this on my own, but you live in me right now. Beat this thing. Help me, Lord. Come on, lift that voice.
I see in my spirit how the river Jordan the, the waters close back that very place where Israel went through and I feel like the Lord is telling somebody here right now is God is closing the wound and turn it into a scar and this scar will become your testimony this scar is something you will be afraid, no longer be afraid to even talk about it this scar will turn you into a star God is closing the river God is closing that wound that thing is healing up right now the Holy Spirit is supernaturally stitching things up right now and you will no longer remember it as a place of your wound but as a place of your wonder as a place of your healing as a place of your destiny as a place of whatever you went through has become something that is a memorial to God's goodness not a monument to your mess not a monument to your failure not a monument to your past people will no longer see you that that way people will no longer call you that way in Jesus name thank you for watching this content I hope this was a blessing to you if you're like me and you like to click on things, click on this, subscribe to our channel and the content will come to you every time we post it. And remember, the best is yet to come.